All right. So welcome to the fourth talk on critical perspectives on technology. Yes, I count these. Um, as some of you know, but those who are here for the first time, uh, I'll just repeat it that I organized these lecture series as part of my project on exceptional norms, marginalized bodies in interaction design. My name is Katja Spiel, and I'm a Hertha Fernberg postdoctoral scholar at TU Wien, where I research marginalized perspectives on technology to inform critical design and engineering. But today you're here to hear from Angelika. And just for those of you who don't know Angelika yet, Angelika Stomeyer is a lecturer and researcher at Northumbria University School of Design and a founding member of the FemPower Tech Network which is in an international network of feminist technology researchers. Inspired by feminist participatory action research, research through design and collective making, she works closely with third sector organizations to creatively integrate digital technologies in service delivery and advocacy work. She aims to work collaboratively on in the world projects that engage people at all stages of the research process to engender change towards more just worlds. So. Subsequently, her presentation is titled Justice, but for whom? Notes on designing with marginalized and criminalized project populations. And you can ask questions during and after the presentation in the chat window or in any kind of way that Angelica tells you that you can do that. Um, and afterwards, we will all be in discussion that is also led by uh, Franziska Tachtler, who is a PhD student and a research associate at the HCI group at TU Wien, where I'm also based. And her research focuses on the role of technology in promoting resilience of young asylum seekers and their social ecological systems. She works with young asylum seekers, volunteer organizations, and mental health service providers using participatory engagement methods. So I think this will be a great conversation. But for now, um, Angelica, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm, I am really excited to talk to Francisca as well. Um, it's such a such a great, such great work that you do. So I'm excited to talk to you. Um, you. As, <laughs> that's all right. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen. And as Kata said, please put anything in the chat. I, I probably won't see it until I finish talking. Um, but that should be all right. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for for inviting me and for for asking me to speak and I'm, I'm going to speak on notes on designing with marginalized and criminalized groups, but I'm taking a bit of a personal approach to this so I am quite nervous and I'm sorry if I'll just speak really quickly. <laughs> um, but you've got my contact details there if there's anything you'd like to talk to me about or contact me with. Um, you've got my email address and my whoops my my Twitter, and if I can actually move my mouse, that would be great. No? Okay. Um, so thank you to Kata for, for the beautiful illustration as well of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And for many, she was an inspirational part of the Associate Justice um, of the Supreme Court in the United States. Um, and she's played a key role in the many movements towards more just worlds through her work in the courts. She's also seen as a kind of feminist icon by many but others have also raised some critique of her work. And I don't know too much about her actually beyond what most people probably know, but I do think she is a really interesting person to pick for the illustration for today's talk, particularly because I'm going to talk about work um, I've done with sex workers and others who are criminalized or they're just criminalized for who they are or the work that they do. And the courts and criminal systems have a very complex meaning for me and for many of those with whom I've worked. Um, and I know that in academia and activist spaces, there are quite rightfully some, some very strong views on these systems as well. So some of these views are starting to seep into HCI as well. And I'm gonna be talking from a kind of human computer interaction and design perspective today. So in recent years, we've been talking a lot about justice about design and technologies, about social change and about how we as researchers and designers can be allies and activists with the people with whom we work. There's also been some interest in our community to work with explicitly criminalized groups. So for example, in 2018, there was a special interest group at a large conference on working with and in prisons. And in 2020, another on working um, 
another event on working on topics of crime and legality in the HCI space. And of course, there's been some really exciting work coming out of several research groups around these topics with quite specific research projects as well. Although arguably, there's been an undercurrent of social justice research in HCI for much longer than that we have been explicitly writing about justice. Participatory design was born out of work with unions in the 60s or so. Participatory action research has been around a long time, as has this understanding of feminist HCI and many other subdisciplines in HCI design and kind of science and technology studies or STS that have tackled these problems for a long time and not just to find solutions but to better understand these spaces and to better understand the different perspectives. However, in recent years, and I mean quite in the last five years or so, the space has grown really, really rapidly. And I'm not going to summarize all of this because that would itself probably take up the whole 40 minutes. Um, but one way of summarizing it for me and for the purpose of this talk is to think across three particular areas. We've been talking about social justice and technology on a broad scale. So things like the ethics of use of facial recognition and injustices in AI. But we've also been talking about digitalization of our services in public, private and third sectors, for example, to collect feedback, to encourage volunteering, to enhance communication and so on. And thirdly, we've talked about a lot about participation of who participation of those who are made marginal in society either as part of the methodologies we use or to better design technologies with and for these often stigmatized and sometimes criminalized groups. I feel like I've been a part of this conversation for a little while now and looking back at my own publications and projects, I, I do cringe a little bit about the way I worded some things, the way I thought about the research. And I'm trying to unlearn a lot of those behaviors of kind of Western academia, of that internalized misogyny I have in myself and the constant attempt of, of thinking beyond subjectivity in research. But I won't bore you, bore you too much with that. Um, so don't worry. But the way I summarize these three areas is to look at how research projects as a whole can help us develop existing movements towards better worlds with and through design. And today, this is what I'm going to be focusing on. I'll do that by first giving you a bit of a trajectory of my own research and how working with groups who experience various forms of stigma, violence, and trauma um, has shaped my understanding. And it is only quite recently that I've started to talk about and think about this as groups who are criminalized. And even, even though that has always played an important part of their experience and my work as well, though perhaps less centrally, it has become much more central to how I write and think about the work I, that I do. Oops, there we go. So the research and writing and sewing that I do builds on um, and kind of the building I do with my co-conspirators in the research process has taught me so many things. And today I want to reflect on what it means to be a part of these movements as a researcher by talking about a theoretical framework I developed during my PhD, which I call justice-oriented ecologies. And also want to expand on this based on some further writing I've done in the last year since submitting the final manuscript of my PhD on meaningful design processes as a praxis of hope. I developed my thinking about these two terms over several years of working with third sector organizations as a researcher, but also based on my experience as someone working within such organizations for many years before I even thought about doing a PhD. I'm going to be using the term third sector organizations, which to me is an umbrella term for groups and organizations that are not part of the private or public sectors. They may be charities, non-governmental organizations, activist groups, or other, other types of groups. And due to the nature of their existence, outside of these two mainstream service providers, they have an inherently political role, which I'll come back to again later. So before I go into too much detail of, of these two terms or ways of looking at design, I want to tell you a little bit about how I got to thinking of, of this. And I'll take you on a little bit of a whirlwind tour of some of the work I've been doing um, from just before I knew that HCI even existed as a field, um, all the way to the work that I was doing during uh, my PhD in a HCI research group. And now in this very strange hybrid space somewhere between kind of HCI interaction design and 
in SDS. So I'll start with my first proper research project, which was during my MA um, in, in social sciences. So as part of this project, I spent two months at a social services center who support people in difficult life, life situations in Bucharest, Romania. I spent almost every day there and shadowed the social worker on outreach, did interviews and focus groups with, with the people using the services, using a toolbox of methods such as timelining diagrams, as you can see, but also things like diamond ranking. And now I understand that this was kind of my first attempt of doing a design workshop before I knew what a design workshop was. Um, I also did some interviews with management and had lots of informal conversations with volunteers and others in the space. So I was working to understand local learning ecologies of adults who are homeless in Bucharest. I knew about some of the context they lived in from living myself in Bucharest for over seven years. And during that time, knowing about the organization that I worked with, and in some, some instances, instances, even volunteering with them on a very unregular basis while I was still at school. So this picture is one of the timelines of the participants who drew um, this during one of the interviews. This was a man who moved onto the streets due to violence and poverty at home, and when he was only six years old. So this was a story that I heard over and over again. And he talks about how it was important for him to learn the life of the streets and how to not be scared. When he was 10, he started to learn about smoking cigarettes and about money. And soon after that, he learned about the importance of knowing who is a friend and who is dangerous, which was followed by drugs at age 14. And the rest of the timeline looks a bit blank with him learning to write at the age of 29. So this particular individual spoke German and English and of course Romanian. So our conversations were often trilingual and he helped me throughout the project by translating certain words I didn't know or didn't quite understand when others were speaking to me. Of course, this image is only a very brief snapshot of our full conversation. And there were of course other learning activities going on um, in that long blank space. In this project, I wasn't necessarily interested in technologies, to be quite honest, um, but the importance of mobile phones and social media came up repeatedly. And this particular participant also related life on the streets um, and the transactions that are a part of this as better than Facebook, because you meet a lot of faces. So as I was analyzing the data, I came up with a series of implications for design as, as we like to do in HCI. So I won't talk too long about all of these, um, but the most interesting aspects of this project for me were the discussion points related to designing with the social politics of learning and designing artifacts of everyday learning, which I took into future projects I worked on. And this idea of mundane technologies which if you know me, I just really won't stop talking about sometimes, is still super interesting to me. And something that I think can bring a lot of value to us as HCI researchers wanting to do work with and in the third sector. So my understanding here is of the importance of really imbuing a contextualized political understanding of people's lived experiences and daily lives into the designs, technologies, artifacts, services, or projects we develop as researchers and designers. Hodgson and Spur's idea of local learning ecologies was interesting and important to me at the time. And you'll see and notice this word of ecologies keep coming back in my work. But with all of this together, and again, without really knowing it at the time, I was looking at harm reduction service delivery as a space for potential digital interaction, innovation, and work. And this project and the connection I started to draw with HCI literatures introduced me to a whole new body of literature and the ACM Digital Library, which opened up a whole new space of wonder for me, excitement and cynicism. So it was with that learning that I started to really work within a HCI research group and a context of HCI. So I was working with people who knew a lot more than me about how to actually make technologies and how to design them in a way that they looked much better than I could ever do. So my first proper HCI project was to explore the opportunities of technologies in supported accommodation among people who didn't know one another um, and in a way where they didn't have to exchange personal information. 
And this was again specifically in a homelessness context originally. To be honest, in this project, almost everything that can go wrong in a tech research project went wrong. Um, it was called VoiceBoard, or it is called VoiceBoard, um, and was later used in later years to teach master's students who were just starting in HCI, like I did when I started this project, about the many pitfalls and risks of this kind of research, of technologies and their bugs, of working with partners that don't have a strong relationship yet, all of those things. Um, so, you know, it, it had some value. <laughs> um, the project was very time constrained and I was trying to do way too much in too short of a time. And thankfully I wasn't doing this alone, um, but I worked with Tom Nappy and Dan Richardson to, to help me build this asynchronous peer support technology that actually ended up being used by alcohol addiction peer support mentors in the end. So this project was broken in all kinds of ways, but reflecting on it has led me to build research projects that have more genuine engagement with partners that are more reflexive, that very specifically look at the socio-political issues of the socio-technical systems and that recognize them to be in ecologies. So after the initial shock of it all, I almost laughed about how big of a failure this project was. But these days, I don't look at it like that anymore because it forced me to reflect on what it is I'm trying to do through my research, who I am trying to do it with, and perhaps most importantly, why I'm trying to do this. It made me a better partner to third sector services. It made me a more understanding researcher and a more caring participant in the wider ecologies in which my research is situated. At the same time, I also became more explicitly interested in feminist theory as part of my research. And it was at this point that I also allowed more of my personal life into my research and the experiences I had with participants during the voice board project and the one before made me care. They made me feel things. And while at first I tried to keep my life and my research separate, fears of subjectivity, um, after voice board, I knew this just wasn't sustainable for me anymore. My feminist and kind of justice oriented agenda to everyday study and work life bled into my research world and deeply intertwined the two. I needed to find a methodology and framing for my research that would bring together my hopes of building research projects that incorporate my underlying ethos of encouraging more equitable, fair and inclusive futures, but that also address the power imbalances and difficult histories of research that tries to do good, but actually makes things worse that allowed for genuine partnership, collaboration and collaboration with those with whom I worked. So the same year, 2016, was also the birth year of FemPower Tech, which again, I'm very happy to talk about, but won't do today. I just wanna say thank you to the amazing people in the group um, for you know, being there since the beginning or dropping in and out. And without this group, I would not be who I am today. And perhaps more importantly for the purpose of this talk, I would not th think about research and technologies in third sector organizations the way I do. And thanks to the work of so many who participate in the group, I've started to not only see the hopeless realities in which we live, but because of the ongoing work of those in and around the group, I'm hopeful to see academia progress, to see our discipline progress, and to see the critical discourses and technologies that are developed. So with this opening up of a new space of research and reading, I'm particularly grateful for the work of Maria Massad and Lynn Dombrovsky, Shawin Barzell, Maria Puig de la Bella Casa, Anne Light, Yoko Kama, and of course, many more. But in this reading, I was also given the confidence to work more proactively with and listening to activists in our own community, including Kata and some of the other speakers who, who've come before me. So putting this learning in relation to the work I'd previously done, I learned that the socio-political concerns cannot be separated from the socio-technical system, that context matters, and that understanding that that is the work that needs to be done before the traditional work of research can be started. It is the work before the work. And as a discipline, I think we need to talk about this work. It has to be addressed and written about, not only because it's part of this all too often hidden labor of feminist and justice oriented research, but also because it allows us to better understand the purpose of our work. 
it gives us a more realistic understanding of what we are doing and gives us an opportunity to speak to those who are earlier in their careers to support PhD students who are doing incredibly important work. So they don't have to go through those feelings of being an imposter in academia for wanting to do work in this way. Um, so in some of my more recent writing, I've started doing this more um, and with the help of STS scholars like John Law's Mess in Social Science Research, where he encourages us to look at the hinterlands of research. Um, and this is actually, I, I read the book at the beginning of my PhD and I thought it made sense, but it only really made sense when I reread it kind of four years, five years later. Um, but it also builds on this idea from Suchman and Haraway and Susan Lay Starr's work and for my particular interest in sewing research, as you can see in that picture, of course, also Daniela Rosna's critical fabulations. So in my PhD itself, these are three of the kind of big projects I worked on during that time, very, very brief snapshots. On the top um, left, we have a, a picture of the materials I used to create the Red Umbrella Archive with sex workers in the northeast of England to commemorate International Day to End Violence Against Sex Workers in 2016 and 2017. Under that, there is a, a, there's a photo of a lot of pieces of paper where I'm trying to do a service diagram of National Ugly Mugs, which is a, a national charity in the UK who supports sex workers and provides um, peer alerting systems for potentially dangerous perpetrators. And on the right, there's a picture of, of the partnership quilt, which you already saw in the previous slide, where I worked with a charity based in the Northeast to collectively sew a blanket that we then digitally embedded touch sensors in, um, so that when you touch the artifact, you can listen to some of the stories that the women wanted you to hear about this object and about the services um, that they attend to. So I, I learned from all of these projects, as well as some additional work I've done since then with Stella um, Lamy de Mami in Montreal and um, on the transactions projects to look at specifically trans sex workers experiences of healthcare provision in the UK. So just very quickly, I wanted to share these as the kinds of projects I'm talking about. So I'm working with an organization very closely and intimately linked with their service delivery and with the things that they already provide to the, to the people they serve and support. But as a designer, I often ask myself, what does it actually mean to have a meaningful design process with these third sector organizations? And in my stumblings to better understand all of this, I came across some of the work from Anne Light and Yoko Akama from 2018. They write about attuning where the designer's embodied knowing shifts from moment to moment, often in responses, often in response to the intersubjective nuances of the group, which is based on an invisible, subtle and complex dynamic and how these dynamics are shaped by the things such as our upbringing, our culture or society as a whole. And I would argue that this is also for non-designers working in designerly or crafty projects. So when working to design in charities, particularly those who support people who experience various stigmas and forms of trauma, the readiness and flexibility Akama and Light talk about are essential. They are also vital to the understanding of the many in-situ decisions I and others have done throughout the project lifespans as individuals, but also collectively. This means that being embedded in and proactively evolving the partnership made, made all of these particular projects possible. They allowed me to better understand how the multiple objects, actors relate to one another. And it helped me develop not only my practice of what Akama and Light called readiness, but also of the poise or the characteristic of self-awareness self of how I act. So the work I talk about strives to represent a prefigurative approach to doing research with third sector organizations to move towards more just worlds from a more holistic and subversive perspective. Taking inspiration from Mariam Assad's prefigurative design and John Law's call to make the hinterlands of research more visible and thinking more deeply about the physical objects of the research and the ongoing relationships I have with organizations has led me to think about what it means to work towards justice together. 
and how we can engage in a praxis of hope with these third sector organizations as a part of the process of being involved in meaningful action and design processes. So based on my PhD fieldwork with multiple sex work support services to develop and ideate on technologies to improve safety, reduce stigma and improve services. And by bringing together the work on multidimensional and abnormal justice from um, justice scholar Nancy, Nancy Fraser and information studies scholars Bonnie Nardiano Day's information ecologies, I developed this framework of justice oriented technologies. I created this because I was trying to figure out what it means to do justice oriented design, particularly with sex workers, which I think by bringing in some of my earlier work, I can now expand to thinking about working with others who are criminalized as well. I developed this because I felt there was a lack of language in our discipline to think through some of the issues I was facing, both when I worked within an ecology and when I wanted to work to learn about the ecology. So what I needed was to think about, so what we need to think about while working with organizations who support people who are criminalized um, and what we need to think about when we are, we are learning about the space as well. In short, working in justice oriented ecologies means understanding the ecology itself, the context in which we working and the different actors and people and technologies and services within that ecology. But we then also have to understand the context within that which that ecology sits and work towards a future that is more just in that setting with an understanding that this notion of justice may not agree with mainstream understandings nor those of the criminal systems. It means understanding the different layers of the meanings of justice, not just for those who provide services or those who are supported to provide protection or those who are supposed to provide protection, but also from those who are victim survivors of the violence and that protection. But since developing this framework, I've been doing some more thinking um, and it's, it's really nice for me to have this language to better think about the work I do within the ecology that is the third sector, as well as wider political spaces that they work within. And also to be able to work to learn about the ecology itself. But what does this actually mean in practice? And, and how does it relate to the projects I've worked on? And how does this theoretical way of looking at feminist and justice oriented research translate into reality? So I'm often thinking about and trying to build on this invisibility of labor and, and that thinking behind all of these projects to learn to understand with the co-researchers and with the participants and project partners that I work with. But because I do this specifically because ways of studying and representing things can have world making effects as Maria Puig de la Bella Casa writes. And I personally want these worlds to be co-created and co-made by all of those who are part of the research process in meaningful ways. I spend a lot of my time building relationships and developing projects collaboratively and having sharing exper expertise as part of these relations allows me to continue to explore the interplay between socio-political contexts or perhaps ecologies might be better and socio-technical systems. We hear this often, but personally, I feel like we often say that we need to do this so we can get access to participants, so we can collect good data, so we can have the right rapport with interviewees, so they give us the answers we'd like them to give us. But the personal nuanced um, responses that we want them to give us, but that's not really fair. And to me, it doesn't sit quite right. So, so I try to do this instead to be building these relationships as alliances as collaboration and as genuine materially enacted solidarity. So it's just a different way of looking at it and thinking about it that has happened in my head over the last few years, which has really flipped what I think about research in my head. So to work in this way though, we really have to genuinely care about our research, the people we work with and the worlds we are creating. It's more than a methodology. It becomes a kind of ethos that flows through what we do and shapes how we do it. We don't do it for the sake of participation, but because we truly believe in it. 
And to do this though, we have to take care of ourselves, of one another and of our worlds. This means we see ourselves as whole humans and our own health and well-being as important. We have to acknowledge the battles in our own workplaces and rest when we need to. Um, we must understand and unlearn our own behaviors and care for one another to work to improve conditions, especially with those who are most marginalized in society, which is usually also those who are criminalized because of who they are or the work that they do. But it also means that we have to care for our worlds, the worlds we inhabit, and those that are adjacent to those worlds that we live in ourselves. So the collaborations that are built as part of this framing can then be constructed as effective alliances between academics, charities, and the service users, as well as others who are involved in the space. Maria Massad and colleagues use the terminology of academic accomplices, and often we hear the word of critical friends. So these become especially pertinent when working on creative projects that manifest the alliances through the materials that we create as can be seen in, in the partnership quilt in the photo. So for me, the process of sewing together or making together and working collectively towards a single piece is a way of making our alliances and the work that was necessary to formulate this genuine and proactive solidarity material. In a pictorial presented at DIS earlier this year, Sarah Fox and her co-authors write, Anyone who has knitted, quilted, scrapbook, or painted with others has felt the way that our focus on doing gives way to talking, starting and top stopping, intimate as if the movement of our hands distracts you enough to overcome the hesitation that limits regular conversation. And it is precisely this overcoming of hesitation and voicing our concerns and thoughts that we can start to see, both metaphorically and literally, the research and craftwork as a co-learning process. Choices as mundane as the color of threads or more precise things like choices in fabrics that we made in the process of making this quilt make physical the relationships, the layers of emotion, of work, of meaning that is in this collaboratively sewn artifact. And it is the technologies that add yet another layer to these stories. They allow us to not only stitch our stories into the fabrics with threads, but by breaking and mending again, but they allow allow us to embed our spoken voices, our thoughts, our feelings, and we are able to make physical and digitally embed the care into the work that we do as designers or HCI researchers in collaboration with third sector organizations. And here I don't mean the care in its very cuddly sense. I mean it in the thick ways that Maria Puig de la Bella Casa and Michelle Murphy talk about. So Puig de la Bella Casa has a wonderful, deep understanding of care that goes beyond what you perhaps imagine when you first hear the word. She talks about a, political, about a politics of care, a moral stance that involves effective, ethical, and hands-on agencies of practical and material consequence. She also talks about the care as a matter of ongoing struggle and how it requires reciprocity. I care for you and you care for me. But she sees this exchange not only between individuals, but rather as living webs of care, which are maintained by individuals giving and receiving back again, but by a collectively disseminated force. As academics working closely with third sector organizations in the ways I've described previously, we are part of this web that Bella Casa talks about. Some academics have again used terms of critical friends, effective alliances or academic accomplices. And a few months ago, I reflected on what this means in a crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and if we claim to care about our research partners and those with whom we collaborate, um, collaboratively produce technologies and perform research projects, we now must put in the work of enacting a genuine solidarity and mutual support. More than perhaps before the pandemic, we have the opportunity to bring our whole identities into the collaborations, not just those part of, of ourselves we see as our researcher selves, but to take up our responsibility as genuine and the reciprocal collaborators. Taking a positive approach to this, um, it gives us an opportunity to develop praxis of hope through thinking with care. And here I want to go further than, than what I wrote earlier this year in saying that it is absolutely vital we build praxis of hope together 
with our friends, our colleagues, collaborators in the third sector. We must work together using our individual skills and networks and resources within these living webs of care. And we can use our design and HCI projects to make physical these manifestations of care, to apply the genuine and material solidarity that we need in these sometimes hopeless times. And through those processes, we can start to share, shape our collective shared praxis of hope. So third sector organizations exist because of a need for their services. They fill a gap in service delivery that is not met by public or private organizations. They often support people who experience multiple disadvantages and as such are often excluded from other services. They're often seen as non-political actors, um, but I see them as inherently political spaces. And learning from Gray's work with Rape Crisis, where she talks about the multifaceted work of the charity and how its ethos of justice and advocating for victim survivors fuels the services they provide. So in short, what we think is a better world shapes what we do. And in turn, this means the charity and their staff, and hopefully us working with them, tend to believe in the possibility of better worlds. So that is what that praxis of hope is. The Joan Haran writes about hope beautifully, um, and you can read the quote on the slide, but this kind of thinking relies on having trusting, caring relationships, and that these relationships we have with others and the care that is expressed in and through them exists or rather should exist also between researchers and third sector organizations, between individuals and bigger organizations or institutions. And the important thing from Haran's quote is this ongoing practice of using our fears and our anxieties to deepen and extend our capacity to as not an individual pursuit but that one that is made possible through the relationships we have with others and the work we do together. So this praxis of hope really is a culmination of the work we do and the belief we have in a, in a more hopeful, more just future. So if we are thinking of the work as charities, uh, of charities as praxis of hope, we can understand that charities um, work towards a world with which they understand as being better, as being more just, as being more equitable. And any technology developed in this context should also support in some, or in some ways facilitate these movements. And these are the kind of three questions I keep coming back to. What do the worlds that they or we are working towards look like? How do we actually work towards these worlds and enact our values in our current practices? And then the last one of, what role can I as a researcher play in working alongside my friends and colleagues and partners to enact this praxis of hope and care through that pragmatic solidarity? So the answers to these questions will always be ever changing and malleable, but is perhaps exactly because of that, um, that the ideas of a praxis of hope are so interesting in this context. So I want to leave you with three opportunities, and I know there's only two on the slides now, um, for a future thought that I've been developing over the summer based particularly on my work with the partnership quilt, but really drawing on STS and HCI literatures of not works from Susan Botker, Dindler and Ibison, um, care, participation and justice oriented technology research, and some of the amazing activists and staff with whom I've had the pleasure of working. I'm not saying that any of these potential avenues for future research are anything particularly groundbreaking, but they've helped me reflect on and understand the reasons for my work and to chart out some potential ways forward. The original points are born out of my reflections on digitally augmenting traditional craft practices for social justice, but I've made a few slight adjustments to the wording of them so they can relate to wider issues of design and HCI. So on sewing or making or designing technologies and charity service delivery, what does it actually mean to create processes that are personal, so individual and personal, but also part of a shared experience? And in what ways can our creative engagements, such as the quilt or any other design process, 
develop sustainable service delivery and sustainable partnerships with third sector organizations or other external partners, but also create those sustainable relationships between staff and service users, between me as an individual and a member of staff or a service user or a volunteer in that specific organization. And I just want to come back to something I wrote with Jen Klamen and Mary Lang in 2019 about a project um, where we were looking at potentially digitalizing a, a peer alerting system for sex workers, where we really reflected on Nancy Fraser's idea of multidimensional justice together. And what we came to as one of the conclusions was that we can use design processes with affected communities as a way of pinpointing routes towards enacting genuine political change to tackle the injustices at their roots, rather than designing technologies in an attempt to rectify some of the symptoms of abnormal justice. And I think reading this back now, having thought about justice oriented ecologies and this praxis of hope, it, it gives a different way of looking at design than at least I was taught originally. It allows us to have a bigger look at what we're looking at, to, have a, to take a step back and really think about what does justice mean in this space? And how can we get there that isn't just putting a Band-Aid on some of the issues, but that gets at the core, at the, at the roots of these injustices? And how can we use design to try to tackle these injustices at those roots? And lastly, the last point um, the, is the one that I'm personally very excited about. It's sewing as and for collective action, or in this new wording, design as and for collective action. If we have these shared praxis of hope, the living webs of care, and then bring together the expertise of different individuals, we have a real opportunity for collective action to fight battles that are bigger than ourselves. The opportunities that come about not only from the processes of projects like the ones I've talked about, but also from the opportunities of sharing the stories of those with lived experience in an intimate, caring, but anonymous way, such as through touch interactive textiles, for example. But this could be transformational. This way of thinking allows us to, rather than firefighting immediate crises, allow us to work towards better worlds where many of these crises can be mitigated beforehand. It can start having us think about how we can reduce poverty and austerity rather than trying to tackle those immediate needs right when they arise. So these are very hopeful futures and some of it perhaps a bit naively hopeful. Um, but they're the kinds of futures that I would like to work towards and I would hope some others would as well. And it is in bringing together this working and hoping that we develop that shared praxis of hope. So these are the, the three design versions um, of what these, these three things could look like. So I want to ask an open question to you before I end my talk. What would a HCI or design practice look like if we work towards personal and shared experiences against a backdrop of bigger justice debates outside our discipline and field? What if we actively worked on a crafting sustainable services and partnerships? And what if we truly used our design processes both as and for the purpose of collective action with our activist friends, our third sector staff and colleagues, and all of those who have lived experience of criminalization, stigmatization, violence, or trauma? Thank you so much for, for your patience and, and for listening to my ramblings. Um, and I really am very intrigued to learn more about what you think. Um, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, 